Coming up, state-of-the-art facilities, simulation technology labs, and virtual medical settings. It's all part of the training for students studying for careers in healthcare at Prince George's Community College. They learn quite a bit of clinical skills. They learn the phlebotomy, they learn the EKG, they learn the lab tests that are done in the hospital. From medical assisting to respiratory therapy, we'll tell you all about the college's allied health programs next on Around Prince George's. Welcome to this edition of Around Prince George's. I'm Charlene Duke, president of Prince George's Community College. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the healthcare industry is expected to grow almost 3 million new jobs by 2020, beating out every other group of occupations. In Maryland, the employment outlook for healthcare workers is also high and expected to increase. Most importantly, the field includes a wide variety of rewarding, high-paying careers for people with associate degrees. That's why the college is committed to preparing students for jobs in this high-demand field and why we're expanding our allied health programs. Joining me to discuss healthcare education and the outlook for jobs in the field is Angela Anderson, Dean of Health Sciences at Prince George's Community College. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Well, you know, Dean Anderson, first, let's talk about the growing demand in the healthcare field. What's driving this growth? Um, there are a couple causes that are inciting that. Um, one is the population is living longer due to advances in medicine, and that usually results in people with more complex health conditions as they age, which requires specialized treatment, which results in a greater need for healthcare workers. The other are, is the changes in the industry itself. Uh, take, for example, the huge move towards the use of electronic medical records and health informatics, which is driving that industry to grow tremendously. You know, I've always wondered, and maybe we'll get to this a little later, to talk about the whole use of maybe predictive analytics as we think about people growing older mm -hmm. and what kinds of things can be done for, pre for preventative health care. But before we get to that, let's talk about this. Aside from physicians and nurses, which I think people typically think about mm -hmm. when we think about healthcare professions, what types of healthcare support jobs are in high demand and what's required for training for a few of those occupations? Um, all of the programs we have at the college are in high demand, some more so than others when you look at the workforce projections for Maryland. Uh, what glared at me was the demand and, and the number of jobs that are going to be created between now and 2020 for medical assistance, it's like 2,500 new positions. And what, what is a medical assistant? What does a person with that kind of credential actually do? Um, medical assistant is the person you see when you walk into the doctor's office, the person who takes your vital signs, gets your history. Uh, sometimes they're on the front end doing the billing and the coding, um, take medical records, assisting the physician. That's the medical assistant. They work in more ambulatory care settings as opposed to when you think of a nurse who works more bedside. And when you talk about other uh, programs that are offered here at the college that are also in high demand, do you want to name a, another two or three of what those are and then what people in those fields would actually do in the field? Sure, um, we have seven allied health programs. So in addition to medical assisting, we have respiratory therapy, which is all about cardiopulmonary treatments, um, managing people on ventilators, uh, radiography, which is in layman's terms, x-ray, um, health information management, which deals with the more administrative billing side of the hospital and the outpatient clinics nuclear medicine, which is pretty self-describing. Uh, one of our newest programs is surgical technology, and that's the person who is in the OR with the physician, basically the physician's right-hand man. So you've talked a, uh, about the programs that we offer, and the next question is probably a more structural question. 
with regard to the organization of health sciences because I also know that in, in addition to what we might consider traditional health fields while they are growing and in high demand, there are some other programs that you find in the health sciences division that really also speak to, I think, the total overall health of individuals. Correct. Um, the health sciences division is made up of three separate departments. Allied Health is one, the other is nursing, which is probably our largest program. And then we have a third department, which is health, nutrition, and physical education. Those are what I refer to as our non-clinical programs. Um, so we have health education, physical education, dietetics, and food sciences. And in those areas, so uh, those people who are in those programs would be learning to do what? What are some of the possibilities for them as they think about careers? Right, well, health education uh, is more about individuals who want to become literally health educators. Um, we're looking at, along those lines, we're looking to start up a public health program because that is also in high demand. So those two programs will probably tie together very closely. Uh, physical education is about wellness and um, we're looking to, as we look at a new possible building, the center, the well, new wellness center, uh, creating more like a sports management program, certified athletic trainer, those types of programs to meet the needs of people who want to sustain their uh, health to you know, get to a point where they're living healthy lives and sustaining it. And then uh, finally, in a few seconds, uh, talk about uh, dietetics and nutrition. Dietetics and nutrition, those are the people who will come and speak to you about making sure that your diet is balanced properly. If you have a specific medical condition, they will educate you on what foods to eat, what foods not to eat, how you can enjoy a little bit of everything as long as you balance it. Thank you, Dean Anderson. We're going to take a short break. When we return, we'll talk more about allied health programs available at Prince George's Community College. Stay with us. I want to be able to impact the community, to reach back to where I came from and pull some people up with me. My name is David and I am your dividend. Prince George's Community College isn't just a place that offers more than 200 academic workforce development and continuing education programs. It's the first step toward the career of your dreams. It's a community of people who want you to succeed. It's where degrees are earned and potential is realized. Apply and register today. Call 301-546-PGCC. That's 301-546-7422. Prince George's Community College, transforming lives. kitchen surfaces, utensils, and hands with soapy water. One in six Americans will get sick from food poisoning this year. Keep your family safer. Check your steps at foodsafety.gov. If you're interested in a career in healthcare, are you aware of all of the different health field options available to study at Prince George's Community College? I'm Angela Anderson, Dean of Health Sciences. I want to share information with you about an educational career program that can transform your life. Respiratory therapy. Respiratory therapists, also called RTs, are critical members of the healthcare team. We work closely with doctors to diagnose, manage, and educate patients with asthma, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and many other respiratory diseases. The patient population we work with spans from premature infants to the elderly. RTs work in fast-paced environments that requires quick decisions, an understanding of technical equipment, and excellent communication skills. All right, I need trouble, please. We have a the need for respiratory therapists continues to rise. The Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates employment growth of about 19% by 2022. After successful completion of program requirements, students in the respiratory therapy program at Prince George's Community College will receive an Associates in Applied Science, 
How does it sound? Do you hear bilateral breast sounds? I uh, have bilateral breast sounds, but it sounds like a flail chest. At Prince George's Community College, the RT program is competency-based and includes both lecture and laboratory requirements. Respiratory therapy graduates from Prince George's Community College are highly sought after by employers in the metropolitan area. If you're interested in starting your career in healthcare, respiratory therapy is a great choice to consider. I hope you found this video to be informative. For more information about the respiratory therapy program at Prince George's Community College, call 301-546-0731 or check us out on the web at www.pgcc.edu. Welcome back to Around Prince George's. If you're just joining us, we're talking about preparing students for careers in the healthcare industry. Here with me is Angela Anderson, Dean of Health Sciences at Prince George's Community College, and we're joined by Nina Lewis, the director of the college's respiratory therapy program. Welcome. Before we continue our discussion, let's take a quick look at how Prince George's Community College utilizes simulation technology to teach healthcare professional skills. Are right, you guys ready? Oh, so fluids, I need some light pressure. Maybe yeah. some dopamine, get some love of love of that as a backup. First blood pressure. How's the blood bleeding? Okay. Checking the three vessel course and the heart Anderson, as we could see from the video, the college has invested heavily in uh, some state-of-the-art equipment, including simulation technology. Talk to us about why that's important. Our goal for all of our clinical health programs is to graduate safe, competent practitioners. And simulation allows us to create, in the laboratory setting, hospital-like settings so that the students are able to practice in a safe learning environment before they go out and work with patients in the clinical setting. The other thing is students don't always get exposure to different types of illnesses or medical emergencies while they're doing their clinical rotations. So simulation allows us to get them that experience in the laboratory setting using high fidelity mannequins and different types of simulation recording software. So it creates scenarios for students and S scenarios, them yes, the scenarios that literally the mannequin is programmed so that if the student responds incorrectly, the patient will have an adverse effect and you might see the monitor go flatline because they administered the wrong drug or too much of the wrong drug or they did something incorrectly. Well, so Professor Lewis, how does technology, as someone who's in the classroom all the time, how does technology really uh, enhance teaching and learning and especially for students in the respiratory therapy program? Well, it's critical at this point um, that students are able to take what they learn in the classroom into the clinical setting. And so the simulation technology allows us to present the student with a clinical situation that they would see in the hospital and decide what would be the right mode of action to take. So students become more confident in the clinical setting. Because respiratory therapists have uh, a large degree of independent judgment in the hospital setting, they're first responders to emergency situations, and uh, in the critical care areas, Therapists are who are taking care of respirators that, or ventilators is, would be the better word, um, that patients are attached to who can't breathe on their own. So it's very, very important that students know how to react to different situations. So simulation has been a fabulous addition to the learning uh, atmosphere. Well, we also know that the job outlook for respiratory therapists is growing. Uh, but for those who um, may not have considered the program, you talked a, a lot about of ventilation, helping mm -hmm. um, patients with breathing. Mm -hmm. Really, um, what would they need to know about respiratory therapy that might have them consider this as a great field? 
Yes, respiratory therapy is rather young when we talk about medical fields. I mean, really, it came into being in the in the late 40s and in the 60s, developed a little bit more to what we are today. So there are a lot of people out there who really aren't aware of what a respiratory therapist does. So uh, in, a, in, a, in the easiest way to say it is we take care of any patient who have, who have uh, any patients who have breathing problems. Now, that can involve uh, a newborn infant whose lungs are not fully developed because therapists are in uh, delivery rooms uh, for infants that are having trouble breathing. And then we'll span the age group all the way up to the elderly who may have uh, existing chronic diseases like emphysema or chronic bronchitis. So uh, the field can be you're either taking care of people in an emergency situation or you are maintaining their health, uh, teaching them about all the different respiratory medications that they need to be on and how to take those medications properly because a lot is geared towards preventive health at this point. Thank you for that. So what's the average entry level salary? And by the midpoint of somebody's career, what might they be expecting to make? Okay, so a student with an associate's degree who have passed their advanced level of exams are starting out in the Washington, Baltimore area at approximately $56,000 a year if they are working the day shift. Uh, evening and night shifts, there's a differential added to that. Mid-career, uh, you can expect that you can be in the seventy-five dollars to $80,000 range if you decide to stay within the clinical setting. And what do you find in terms of our graduates? What percent of them are, are getting jobs upon graduation? And I would assume uh, pass, taking the licensure examination yes. and being successful. Yes, once a, once a graduate passes their advanced uh, level exams, they're in high demand. And at this point, we're employing about 80% of our students uh, of the last graduating class. 80% are employed right now. Um, the 20% that are left are, are working on their uh, advanced level exams because when these students come out of school, there's a considerable expense between paying for all the exams and their licensure. So that sometimes delays them because we would like them to take these, these exams within the first month or month and a half of school. So Outlook is very good right now. If I walked in the door and said, you know what, I'm here, I want to be a respiratory therapist, mm -hmm. what, what are the, what's the background that I need to have? Are there prerequisites or co-requisites before I can be admitted into the program? There are. Uh, the prerequisites for the respiratory therapy program are uh, a math course for Prin Prince George's County. The math course is Math 1120 which is finite math, although we do at this time encourage the student to try and take the college algebra class. Uh, also, um, English Composition I and Anatomy and Physiology I are the three prerequisites to get into the program. Minimum GPA, uh, 2.5 at this point, along with taking the TEAS-5 tests. Those are the selective admissions process. So, and we know that's important because we want to make sure that students are academically eligible right. for the program. Yes. So what we want to do is to thank you, Dean Anderson and Professor Lewis for joining us on the program today. Coming up next, we'll talk to students about the college's newest allied health program. We'll be right back. Prince George's Community College isn't just a place that offers more than 200 academic workforce development and continuing education programs. It's the first step toward the career of your dreams. It's a community of people who want you to succeed. It's where degrees are earned and potential is realized. Apply and register today. Call 301-546-PGCC. That's 301-546-7422. Prince George's Community College, transforming lives. If you're interested in a career in healthcare, are you aware of all of the different health field options available to study at Prince George's Community College? I'm Angela Anderson, Dean of Health Sciences. I want to share information with you about an educational career program that can transform your life, medical assisting. All right, on the count of three, we're gonna stand up. Ready, one, two, three. A medical assistant uh, supports the work of physicians and nurses, usually in a clinical setting. What that means is that when we visit a doctor's office, the person who greets us, the person who cares for us, the person who spends time with us before and after we see the doctor is most likely a medical assistant. 
Never ever let the equipment get below the level of your waist because then it's not sterile. They have clinical skills such as phlebotomy, injections, EKGs, medication administration, setting up procedures, preparing and sterilizing instruments, taking blood pressure and vitals. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, the employment outlook for medical assistants is very good and expected to increase 31% from now to 2020. What we're going to learn about is what makes autoclave so special. Prince George's Community College offers an associate's degree in medical assisting. Upon completion of the program, the student participates in a 160-hour internship at a local healthcare facility. Then the student is eligible to apply for a number of national certifications. At Prince George's Community College, the medical assisting program is competency-based and includes both lecture and laboratory requirements. Clinical simulation is heavily incorporated into the program. Medical assisting graduates from Prince George's Community College are highly sought after by employers in the metropolitan area. For more information about the medical assisting program at Prince George's Community College, call 301-546-0731 or check us out on the web at www.pgcc.edu. Welcome back to Around Prince George's. Medical assisting is the newest allied health program available at Prince George's Community College. And here to tell us all about it is Professor J. David James, the director of the medical assisting program, and two of his students, Lancy Carante and Nedra Butler. Welcome. But before we get started, let's take a look inside the classroom of our medical assisting program. Look at the left upper aspect of the slide. Mm -hmm. Take a look there. You see what they look like cats. Yeah. Um, we have those here in the lab. We'll be using them. This is fun wrapping instruments. We'll learn how to do Professor James, as we saw from the video, students are learning about a variety of things needed in a clinical setting. Explain what medical assistants do and where do they primarily work? Well, as you can see from the video, they learn quite a bit of clinical skills. They learn the phlebotomy, they learn the EKG, they learn the lab tests that are done in the hospital. But also, they are uh, specialized to work in the front office and do the insurance coding and the billing, and uh, also to be able to administer medications. Uh, medical assistants are primarily trained to work in a doctor's offices or a doctor's office or a clinic. And that's interesting, so that that means that when I go to see my uh, medical professional, the person who's really helping me doing a number of the things you're talking about are medical assistants. Quite often the person who greets you, who takes your insurance, who processes it, who takes you back and does your weight and your injections, that probably is a medical assistant. Nedra, talk to us about why you chose this field. I chose medical assisting as a way to get into the healthcare field. It seemed like it would be a good foundation on how to learn both the clinical aspect and the administrative aspect. And then, uh, what are your career goals? I hope to continue as a medical assistant and to learn more specifically about billing and coding and to also, also improve on my clinical skills. And then, Lancey, a, a similar question. You recently commit, co completed the program. Mm -hmm. So what did you like most about it? Oh, definitely um, the teamwork that I had the, um, with my classmates. Um, the program is very challenging, but I had a really good study group to help us, you know, help us um, like get the good grades and learn from each other and our mistakes. So that teamwork portion, and I would assume, mm -hmm. Professor James, that that's something too that you're um, maybe uh, subliminally teaching students about is because when they move into this work setting, working in teams is critically mm -hmm. important. Yep, the old saying is collaborate or die. <laughs> so, uh, you know, they have to learn that the healthcare setting is a setting of team members. And it's mm -hmm. something that we stress and I'm glad that they're picking it up. Yes. And uh, why, would, why should students choose the program here at Prince George's Community College? Because we are very committed to student success. And yes. indeed, they learn the clinical skills 
but uh, they go into the health information management program to learn their administrative skills. Mm -hmm. So they can graduate with a medical assisting associate's degree, a national certification in medical assisting, and also be a coder and a biller and get that certification as well. Well, I noticed that when uh, Professor James talked about um, being very much committed to student success, you all were shaking your heads. Oh, yeah, yes. definitely. So, <laughs> so yeah. give yes. us a few examples about how you know that the program and the professors are committed to your success. He's really good about encouraging us to work together, as he said, in the classroom. We have a lot of projects and assignments that are actually relevant to what we'll be doing in the in the workplace, we're working on, in our administrative class now, an assignment for emergency preparedness, how to set up a plan for an office. So he's really good about tying what we're learning into how it will, uh, what it will look like in the real world. And I'm assuming mm -hmm. those are the same kinds of yes. things that you see? Um, he definitely encourages us to always practice, you know, our, our vital signs, our, um, like, EKG, definitely, um, knowing what um, equipments we have, what um, like supplies that we have, knowing the you know the office settings, knowing what mm -hmm. pretty much like encouraging us to and pushing us to know and learn and drill it in our heads, so that when we go out there in the offices that you know we're not just newbies. We've learned this stuff, and he is very good, and the programs and the professors are very good at like you know, drilling that in your head. Okay, mm -hmm. so that uh, as soon as yeah. you walk in those doors, you are yeah. professionals, yes, you're yes, members definitely. of that yep. team, and you yes. know what to do. Yes. So, Professor James, what are the criteria for admissions into the program? If you'll tell us quickly. We require college-level mathematics and college-level English to get into the program. And that's it? That's it. And then I would imagine just a desire to work in a healthcare setting definitely. where you are providing skills and where you're providing really of uh, uh, access to skills to mm -hmm. potential patients mm -hmm. uh, who are coming in to see their doctors. Mm -hmm. Definitely. You want a special type of person, a person who's interested in helping others. Well, that's really great, and I really want to thank you all for being with us and sharing information about the medical assisting program. That's all for this edition of Around Prince George's. And as we close, here's another look inside the simulation labs at the Center for Health Studies at Prince George's Community College. Thanks for watching.